I remember when in the run up to the 2015 elections and even 2019 elections, there was this conversation about a debate, presidential debate. And Buhari, of course, wouldn't want to debate. He didn't want to debate in 2019. In fact, he had zero incentive to because he was the incumbent. He had nothing to prove, so to speak. But Nigerians still voted for him knowing that. You know, lately people are saying things like, this is a man who has never written a book. This is a man that doesn't have even a pamphlet to show what his ideas are, what his thoughts are, what he even thinks about anything. Literally, people have just spent decades projecting their own feelings onto this man. He's never said anything. He's never put anything in paper, which is why it was also easy for him to deny some of the election campaign promises that supposedly he now says his party made on his behalf. He didn't make himself in 2015. But Nigerians still voted for him in 2019. So if I was a Buhari, why would I care about having an ideology if I can win elections without having any, if I can get millions of votes without having any? Welcome to Ideas Untrapped, and I am your host, Toby Lawson. Ideas Untrapped is a podcast that examines the role of ideas in a political economy. It's also a podcast about spreading ideas on growth, development, and progress. Welcome to Ideas on Trapped, and today I am speaking with Aisha Oshori. Aisha is a lawyer, and she is the former CEO of Nigeria Women's Trust Fund. She has consulted for various international development organizations, and she's currently the executive director of Open Society Initiative for West Africa. You're welcome, Aisha. Thank you, Toby. It's a pleasure to be here. I read your book. Very, very fascinating. And one thing that jumped at me straight away is the tension or the balance between political agents and uh, systemic governance in Nigeria. In your experience, and of course, from your analytical perspective in observation, where do you think the true power lies in our system? Is it with individual actors or with the structure that they built around them via the party or their various networks? That's a very fascinating question. And it would be hard to say that it's one or the other. It's both. It's the individuals and it is the structures. And I can explain. When I say structures, I would be referring to something including the culture of what politics means and what political parties are designed to do or have been doing in Nigeria. Some might say from the 60s. So that DNA, the hardwiring of what a political party should be, the understanding of how it should be structured, how it should work, how it should be manipulated, all those things are part of the structures. The structures are beyond the internal mechanisms of the parties, whether it's the National Working Committee or the National Executive Council. It's beyond those structures. When I refer to structures, I would be referring to, as I said, the DNA, the history, the hardwiring in our consciousness, both the public and the politicians, of how political parties should behave what's expected of political parties, all those things help determine how power is obtained and how power is used in Nigeria. And then the individuals come in, in that they are the ones who know how to manipulate and manage, depending on how you want to look at it, manipulate is one way, manage is another. These structures for their benefit largely, the benefit of their close associates and a handful of hangers-on. And then maybe you would argue their communities where there's a trickle-down effect. I'll explain why the individuals are important. We don't have to go too far. We can just start with 1999. If you look at some of the most powerful individuals in any of the parties, whether it was PDP, whether it was ANPP, whether it was AC or AD, you find a pattern in the names and faces and where they go, who they align with, and how the parties sort of evolve. So AD moved to ACN, ACN did a merger with CPC to become the ruling party now, APC. So you find the individuals who are powerful within these structures, they're the ones who understand this hard wiring of how political parties should be. They're the ones who have been in the system for a long time and understand it. So that's why I would say it's both of them. 
And when these individuals decide to leave parties, they typically go with almost everyone and the party doesn't survive after they leave, which shows how powerful they are. It's also a reason why you see the same actors in the different parties, because the individuals who know how to, let's just say, be politicians, have the same ethos. Regardless of what the name of the party is, they have the same outlook toward how political parties should be run, how power should be gained, and how power should be used. One thing you talked about quite early in the book is the role of ideology in politics and Mm -hmm. how it is missing. It's almost non-existent. One good example is a case of Kogi State where you have two senators running against each other four years apart in different parties. Uh, There's the case of Edo where the upcoming elections would actually have basically the same people on the ticket of the two main parties, but now they've more or less switched sides. Cross-carpeting is the colloquial word we use for it. Would ideology really help bring some stability and hopefully sanity to our politics? Because it feels like our politicians do not stand for anything. They would argue with you that they do stand for something. And I'm sure many of the politicians that are in APC today will tell you that they consider themselves progressives, maybe left of center. I don't think BDP has described itself as center or right of center. Right being more conservative, left being more progressive. But I've heard APC politicians describe themselves as more progressive anyway. And some of them would argue with you that they do have ideologies. But of course, we know that it doesn't seem that way because of how easy it is for them to move between parties, which I mentioned earlier. So if, as you point out, once upon a time, Eze Yamu didn't have the characteristics and values of what an APC person should be, you would have to ask what has changed in four years that suddenly he's able to be the ideal candidate for the APC, despite everything they had said about him four years ago. You would like to think that as they present Ezeyamu now as a brand for APC, that there will be some sense of how he has been rehabilitated from his prior point of views, his prior values that make him now aligned to APC. But there's no pretense in doing that because they know that in a way nobody cares, so to speak. And it could be that, is it that nobody cares, that's us, the public, or are we apathetic? Do we no longer care? Did we care once upon a time? Did we never care? For me, those are the more interesting questions because this idea that you have parties where you don't know who your members are, that's been something that's been going on for years and years. It wasn't this bad in the run-up to the 60s when we had the old parties that were led by Awolowo, Amadubello, and Namdi Azikiwe, NCNC, or inheritors of those parties, the National People's Congress, NPC, that started yeah. as Northern People's Congress. So in a way, you actually even argue that our parties have deteriorated in terms of structure. But those parties had some modicum of membership They have some modicum of order. But as time went on where the lines between public and private or the lines between, let's say, governance and the treasury, public officials and the treasury became more blurred, the more being in government became a route to access to fantastic riches, the more important it was to be in politics, the more important it became to capture power because that was your route to fantastic riches. So the point I'm trying to make in a roundabout way is that the parties right now have no incentive to change their DNA or to change the way they've always done things. The formula has worked for them so far, they would say. They win power. They might be out of it for one or two election cycles. PDP had said they will rule for 60 years. Thankfully, they were out in 16. Now, APC probably has the same feeling that they will rule for 60 years, but it's quite likely that they will not. The faces don't change. And even when the faces change, the behavior and the values don't change. The culture of what politics is doesn't change. So would it not be up to Nigerians to say, why do we keep voting for these parties that have no ideology? My point is, the parties will not change until we, the people, say they should change. And how many Nigerians care whether the parties have ideologies or not? So the truth is, is they disconnect one The people in the parties have been winning elections this way. Nobody has challenged them. They're doing fine. They have no reason to change the formula. And two, Nigerians are not demanding that they should have ideologies or they should speak on those ideologies. I remember when, in the run-up to the 2015 elections and even 2019 elections, there was this conversation about a debate, presidential debate. And Buhari, of course, wouldn't want to debate 
he didn't want to debate in 2019. In fact, he had zero incentive to because he was the incumbent. He had nothing to prove, so to speak. But Nigerians still voted for him knowing that. You know, lately people are saying things like, this is a man who has never written a book. This is a man that doesn't have even a pamphlet to show what his ideas are, what his thoughts are, what he even thinks about anything. Literally, people have just spent decades projecting their own feelings onto this man. He's never said anything. He's never put anything in paper, which is why it was also easy for him to deny some of the election campaign promises that supposedly he now says his party made on his behalf. He didn't make himself in 2015. But Nigerians still voted for him in 2019. So if I was a Buhari, why would I care about having an ideology? If I can win elections without having any, if I can get millions of votes without having any. Let's unpack the history here a bit. Do you think that the stunting of our political evolution, particularly by the number of coups we've had and military intervention, played a role in this particular problem? Because we know that other than the rule by force and fear, which is the method of the military, they also spent quite a lot of time and money buying allegiances from civilian elites, which gave them some form of legitimacy, and which I think is now being replicated in civilian rule. What do you think of that? Uh, I think it's valid in a way, half and half. There definitely was a truncation of our political evolution and political growth and development. And not even only a truncation, a poisoning. There was a poisoning of our sense of what it means to be a citizen, a poisoning of, of our sense of responsibility and accountability. Some people would argue that we're all even suffering from PTSD because there's a lot of violence as well. And it's hard for ideology to thrive where there's high poverty and where there's violence as well. So I would agree that, yes, to a certain extent, the coups, the military rule, definitely, in my mind, has uh, impacted on our political development. But we cannot blame them entirely, because you know that we did have intellectuals. You know, we had the radical ABU academics. We had thriving, even in Ibado, Ife. There was a culture of resistance, so even during the military rule. But oddly enough, Somehow this radicalism, this pushback on authority, it doesn't seem to have survived going back to a democracy in 1999. And some would argue that we're not even a democracy right now. We're just practicing civil rule. We're not quite democratic in the sense of our structures and the accountability between governments and citizens. So I would say again, like a lot of my answers would be that it's half and half. I don't like us to shirk responsibility completely. Has there not been enough time between 1999 and today? That's 20 years. We celebrated 20 years of democracy last year, of uninterrupted democracy, which is the longest we've ever had democracy in Nigeria, uninterrupted. We celebrated 20 years. Is 20 years not long enough to have developed this culture? If there was a deliberate sense, not only from the politicians, but also from the academics and the think tanks and civil society, that it was important to develop our political culture and political theory. What you find, though, is that everybody seems extremely comfortable with the way our parties have evolved since 1999, built on some of the interference of the Babangida transition program, which took a long time. So that's when I talk about the poisoning of the well. The years of military rule had helped us to compromise our academics, compromise our sense of values almost entirely, you know, and that's still lingering. The damage that was done to our unions, the damage that was done to student associations, which would have also helped to develop this thriving political culture. All those things were decimated during the military era, and nobody has deliberately rebuilt it. You go to our universities today, you find that many student unions are not actually even democratic either. You find that in many cases, the vice chancellor or the ruling council of the university, if there are going to be elections, they want to be able to determine who wins those elections. That culture of manipulating who gets into a position has poisoned everything. The Nigerian Bar Association, I'm sure it's the same with the Nigerian Medical Association. I'm sure it's the same with FIDA on the women's side. So it's poisoned everything. But as I said, where is the deliberate efforts? You know, we're having a conversation. Where would you say over the last 20 years you have seen deliberate efforts from politicians, one, two academics, three civil society, four even just concerned citizens, to build an alternative model for, for what a political party should be? Why do you think that is? 
I am curious. Is it ignorance? Is it education? Is it apathy? Why? Why has there not been that, at least on a scale, that is enough to push the boundaries a little bit from the status quo? Why has there been stasis in that regard? Huh, that one, I, to be honest, I would say that it's beyond my pay grade or my understanding grade, to be honest, because I am as baffled as anyone else about why this hasn't happened. And the truth, I'm not a student of politics or political science. It's just interest that has made me do a bit of reading over the last couple of years. But as you pointed out, I studied law in school, maybe did political science for one or two electives before I entered year two in Unilag. So I don't know, but I would say, picking up from just observing, that it is a mix of apathy, but which is odd. We didn't think that being under military rule was inevitable, but somehow we think that how things are done now are inevitable. I don't know what has happened to our sense of struggle, and maybe that's it. Maybe there was no collective hour. I'm saying hour, but the truth is it was a handful of people who pushed out the military. It was a handful of people who won independence from the British. And of course, that winning of independence from the British was not unrelated to what was happening across the rest of the world. The World War had ended about 15 years before. The idea of colonialism was sort of dying. So the time was right. So people will argue that in the way that South Africans struggled to end apartheid, we as a nation, Nigeria, have we've actually never struggled collectively for anything. Maybe the biggest struggle we've had was to get rid of the military. But as I said, even then... You'll be hard-pressed to feel that it was a collective effort as opposed to civil liberties organization and a handful of people, the Becker and some cookies and co and co. When you hear those stories, and maybe the stories are not complete, so framing an answer, why is it this way? It's a mix of ignorance. It's a mix of not being taught our history, the danger of the single story that Chimamanda has warned us about. But we've only seen one side of our history. We're not sort of prepped to be citizens who are active. And I think this speaks to some elements of decolonizing our education because when you're learning in school, whether it's primary school, secondary school, university, I did social studies, I did history for SSC, and I took some courses in university, you find that your history just raises you to be accepting of what there is as opposed to questioning. And I think a lot of the colonial countries, whether it's Francophone, West Africa, or Anglophone, West Africa, suffer from this educational system that was designed to just breed civil servants who will just, you know, do what they're told and protect the status quo. So that's one. Two, I think we like quick fixes. And I'm understanding of this. I have empathy for this feeling of wanting a quick fix. But we need to invest long term. Part of the reason why we're not thinking about the investments that need to be made in changing political culture is because we want a quick fix. Over the last couple of, maybe like the year, year and a half, the last year and a half, I would say, there's been this romanticization of the NURTW. I've seen people on Twitter say, oh, we should go and copy their model. And I laugh, I smile. I'm like, what's their model designed to do? I'm not saying it's an unworthy exercise to study them. You study every model if you want to dismantle it. In fact, you should know even more than the people who follow the model, what the model is based on, if you want to replace it with something better. But the idea that well-meaning people, in quotes, because these days, when people say they're well-meaning, when people say they want to change things, we've learned from the APC that we should be suspicious and ask questions. What does change mean? Because it might mean that you just want to capture power. You don't necessarily want anything to change. So back to NERTW, you want to use NERTW's model to do what? Because their model is designed to be exploitative. Is that a model that you want to copy and use for what? I mean, you have to think about these processes and ideologies and structures almost like a factory, a sausage-making factory. Anything you put in will come out looking like a sausage. But we don't want to take the long-term view. We're always looking for the quick fixes. I mean, it's baffling. Maybe I should take a peek at your Twitter feed that (laughs) anybody would even suggest NURTW as a viable model for political organization. Whoa. Are you saying you've not seen that? No, I haven't, actually. Uh, No. In fact, it's not that I'm I'm bad with names, so I don't want to sort of pick names. But I'm quite sure people like uh, maybe Alabi, the guy who... I think he's like a business entrepreneur who's gone to the House of Reps in 2019. Is that his name? Alabi? Oh, Aki Alabi. Alabi. As, as I said, please, maybe not him, but I just feel somebody with that type of name 
or maybe yeah. it might be um i'm trying to open my twitter feed now as we're talking so this is an interactive conversation yeah. so i've seen that for more than one person say oh you know eh, no maybe even reen sola abiola i think she might be a fan of that school of thoughts and to be honest it's framed in a way to say oh you elite people you're sneering at the NURTW because they don't speak english it's not that mm-hmm. at least it's not that for me it is what is the structures designed to do is exactly it and if i may is ask it... sorry i'm interrupting so, do they have specifics i mean what about that model are we supposed to learn from it's funny you said that because I remember that some other people pushed back now sharing stories of the kind of havoc that NURTW members have wrecked on their communities or in markets and things like that. So people are like, look, stop romanticizing these people. But you're right, you know, there's this whole thing of, oh, but they have spread. They're all over the place. Yeah, they didn't wake up in the morning and suddenly had spread. So you now want to adopt a model where you don't want to interrogate what the model was designed for. In fact, I talked about decolonizing education, which actually even decolonize our government. Because the truth is, our government was inherited from the British, who were here to strictly exploit us for their benefit. It's not far-fetched to say that that's what our politicians are still doing today. And they're not alone. We keep pointing fingers at the politicians, but the civil servants are also exploiting us on the structures that the British had left for us, which we inherited and we haven't really changed since then. You see all sorts of things in our civil service, like leave allowance. This was for the British who had to go home for the summer. We still have those things in our system. So when we even talk about decolonizing education, we even need to decolonize our governance and what governance is supposed to do. So it comes back to the thinking that needs to be done. But to be honest, you know, there's this sense of no, 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 we'll enter government and then we'll change it from there. And my theory from the little that I experienced, again, I admit that I only experienced a little because all I did was primaries. But even the primaries showed me that what it takes to win an election in Nigeria, I doubt if when you finish, you still, even if when you are entering, you had lofty ideas of what you wanted to do, what you wanted to achieve. I can bet that by the time you win, at least 50% of those ideals would have been shattered. You will no longer be the person you were when you started that process for you to succeed. And in the first place, for you to succeed, there are some traits that the party owners would have seen in you that will make you a good candidate. So I guess that's part of the dilemma that we're in is that we romanticize things. We're not thorough. We're not detailed. It could be a whole national malaise. We don't have high standards. We don't want to be held to high standards so that we don't have to hold anybody else to high standards. So, yeah, largely we're just a collective of people who just want quick wins, easy way. We don't seem to see that the suffering that we're going through it doesn't have to be that way, you know, that there could be a better way of living. Now everybody's gaze is on Canada. We, it's like a joke now. But within the jokes and the banter, it's just the sense that, you know, nobody wants to build Nigeria. You now want to move to Canada where they have struggled to build their own country and they're still struggling. I've had the privilege of being in Germany for the last year. And I've been saying to people, I'm like, Germany, they have lights, they have water. In the one year that I've been here, I have not had cause even once. To even wonder that if I touch the switch it's just it's not even in me whereas in nigeria every single day is as what's the word as dominating as greeting or as air for you to wonder whether there's light yeah so but here where they have light and they have water they're on the streets every day i'm not saying the whole city is on the streets but pockets of people who care about one thing or the other are marching and complaining and lobbying because berlin is the capital for germany sometimes Farmers will come from across the country in their trucks, you know, tractors. You know how big tractors are? Yeah. You find tractors all over the city, blocking roads, constituting a nuisance. They are protesting something that's to do with agricultural policy. So these are people whose lives you would say are fairly okay, but they're not resting on their laurels. They're not saying, ah, everything is good. They are still fighting, demanding, pushing, lobbying. Whereas we, that have so much that's wrong, we're not even doing anything. So going back yeah. to the ideology question, the people in power, they're looking at us and they're like, it's hard to tell that we want more. Abi, if you are Buhari, would you think that the nation wants more? I don't know the governor of your state. If you're in Lagos state, does someone who feel like Lagosians want more? It's interesting you talk about this demand for good governance, which we don't have. I'm just wondering, if you are a civil society, you Caesar, which you are, in a, I am. In a way. <laughs> yeah, and you want to take a stab at this problem. Where do you 
shot? Is it bottom up? Is it top down? If, if you want to triage your resources, where, right. where should you focus on first? I would say it's the middle. My argument is very simple. I say the middle because my knowledge of history, the limited knowledge I have of history and of struggles, is that it's the people in the middle. And I know that there's this argument that we don't have a middle class in Nigeria, but I guess for me, I would just say the middle is me and you, who have enough to eat every day. We may not eat everything we want to eat every day, but we have enough to eat every day. We have a steady income, whether it's every month or whether it's from a business that comes, you know, quarterly. We aspire, maybe some of us travel a couple of times a year, every couple of years. That class, that middle, the people who can afford data, the people that can afford the luxury of being on Twitter for a few hours every day or Facebook every day, that's the middle. For me, most movements come from the middle. They will obviously trigger something with the lower class, the working class people, the people who live on daily wages. At a point, the struggle would tip over to them and they too will adopt it. But as you say, the triad, my energy would go on the middle. My energy would go on the middle who are young. I was also going to prioritize within that middle. Because those are the people who should have the luxury of thinking. Me and you. Who are not bogged down by hunger. And poverty is real. Poverty is really real in Nigeria. Are we expecting the people who are struggling for a daily meal to be the ones who are going to do the thinking, the planning, and the heavy lifting? I don't think so. So I would focus on the middle. And what would I be focusing on the middle for? I would be saying to the middle... How do we organize? And you see, when I say organize, I'm using that word in a technical sense. When we heard that Barack Obama was a community organizer, I don't know how many Nigerians understand what that means. There are schools of thought around organizing. There's Snowflake model. There's the Alinsky model. There's the LCN model, leading uh, leading change network model. These are models that I know are used in America. And I ask myself, what are the models for organizing that we use in Nigeria? What are the models of organizing that we use in West Africa? So far, I've come up with very little. For me in civil society, the new opportunity that I see is teaching organizing in a structured manner, creating a model for organizing. And the truth is, we have things in our history that we could build that model of organizing around. We've had the Abba Women's Movement. I would put that as a classic case of organizing. How did those women do it? What triggered it? What happened? It's not a footnote in history. Oh, there was the Abba women, which is how we learned about it. The Abba women, they did this, this, this. They put a, a tax on their souls and they were not happy. And this. No, it is to go beyond that to see how they did it. How did they organize? How did the women get other women to buy into this? In today's day and age where when to organize, they're saying, oh, how many people from Kogi State? How many people from Nasarawa? Which is not, for me, the key thing. The key thing is how many people who feel this pain, how many people who have this value. It's not about the geography, but even in terms of putting together movements in Nigeria, you find that we're still looking at federal character. I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, but I'm saying it cannot be the predominant thing because that's how our politicians organize. We cannot keep using their models. There's a reason why they use their models. We cannot use their own models when we want to organize to push them out. So that's where I would start, teasing out a framework for organizing for us in Nigeria based on our own stories. What did Mbeko do? How did they do it? What did they learn? What were the mistakes? What drove them pushing out the military? Where did they go wrong? Where did they go right? And then using our own 21st century experiences from Sudan, from Egypt, from Algeria, Tunisia, from Black Lives Matters, People are looking at Black Lives Matter as if it's, oh, I don't know how to explain it, as if somebody just shot a gun and out came Black Lives Matter. They've been doing Black Lives Matter for years. This is where preparation meets opportunity. The longest movement or at least advocacy campaign we've had is Bring Back Our Girls. Maybe also in terms of thinking about a model for organizing, we would look at some of the things they did right, learn from some of the things they didn't do well. But for me, that would be the start. So you'd have that organizing model, and then you now democratize that organizing model so that everybody can use it if they want. Whether it's hairdressers on a street or in a community, local government who are tired of being taxed, how do they use that model to organize? But on a larger scale, then it would be how do me, you, and other people that think like me and you, who want to use that model to build the power that's needed to demand for the structural changes we need? It will take time, it will take research, it will take knowledge, it will take mobilizing, it will take organizing to get to that point. But what should sustain us is that in the last decade, decade and a half, 
most of the real fundamental changes that have happened around the world have happened not through elections and have also not happened because of coups and have also not happened because people that were oppressing suddenly woke up and said we're tired of oppressing. They've happened because of non-violent movement, which requires between 3.5% or 5% of your population to want that change bad enough. I think we can do that in Nigeria, but nobody's doing it. Listening to you, I try to look at some of the potholes, so to speak, in this model. You talked about bring back uh, girls. I was at the Abuja sitting in 2014, and I think, I think was it the second day or the third day, and Dino Melaye came for whatever reason, anyways, and said, I don't know how true that is, that, oh, I heard that 150 million naira has been released by the NMPC to start a rival movement. Now, that seems outrageous, but by the very next day, there was a rival gathering at Unity Fountain chanting, release our girls. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, I mean, by the next day of that rival organization, it descended into violence. You know, I, I believe so much in the middle class and changing the demand for good governance, but I keep looking at the threats, especially around poverty and how quickly the political class, the ruling class, can easily use money and influence to mobilize for violence. And I think that may drive apathy on its own, on the part of people that are willing and even able. No, I hear you completely. And to be honest, yes. In fact, it's now become a fad. I mean, as a member of civil society, we know, for example, that Amnesty International is constantly picketed. Every time they come up with a report or a press statement that indicts the government and the military and soldiers for extrajudicial killings or overstepping their bounds, especially in terms of loss of civilian lives, we find paid protesters coming out with their posters. We, to be honest, we've seen this across board. You know, we've seen people protesting for Dezani. The funny one was the Leave Dezani, where it was spelled L-I-V-E, Leave Our Dezani Alone, which is like mm-hmm. lie. It's now an industry, so we can expect it. But should that deter us? I don't think so. To me, it doesn't deter us. And this is another mistake that we make. This is another mistake that, in quotes, the people that want to change always make a mistake because they want to keep following the models of the politicians. Now, the average politician thinks, okay, he can outspend you. He probably can, you know. But you know, these protesters, we find that at the end of the day, they'll be fighting in one corner. Maybe they were promised 1,000. They can only give them 500. It's not sustainable on their part. Yes, they can bring out their release our girls people day one, day two. If we were still going for day 100, you think somebody, who is going to bring that money? Who, who is the politician that will keep saying, let's keep giving these fake protesters money to come out? They will now have to change track. That's where, we, where they will now try to use violence or, you know, the tactic of Abuja now is to seal off the area where the Bring Back Our Girls used to sit in the name of construction. Or they might try and start infiltrating the movement to pay people off, to be disruptive. Mm-hmm. We can expect these things because these are tactics that we know will be used. How do we prepare against it? That's all part of what the organizing and the struggle is around. I'm not going to tell you that it's not going to happen, but because we know it's going to happen, then we can mitigate against it. We can expect it and we can work around it. But the truth is, of course, anybody that benefits from the status quo is not going to let go of that status quo easily. We can, again, link this conversation to Black Lives Matter. What is so hard about saying stop killing innocent people why is there such pushback why are we seeing such pushback from the police about not arresting people indiscriminately not shooting and killing people not using indiscriminate force on people because as i mentioned the dna of our political parties is in the dna of the united states police force because the united states police force is also tied to the legacy of slavery and dehumanizing black people but does that mean we should do struggle absolutely not Exactly. So we see the potholes, we acknowledge the potholes, and we walk just as we do with our cars. We swerve and avoid the potholes. But the key thing that would help us avoid these potholes, Toby, is the values that we use to organize. So as soon as me and you think that for our movement to be powerful, we need Dino Melaye, we need Adam Zoshemole, 
we need the uh, Galina Aba. That's our downfall. Let's move away a bit from that. We'll come back to some of that, that issue. Let's talk about gender-based violence, which is something that I noticed you've written about recently. If Twitter is a reflection of reality, there's been an incredible surge in such violent incidents over the last couple of months. And like everybody else, I wonder what's going on. Has it always been like this or there is an underlying psychological reason behind mm. the current wave we are seeing? Mm-hmm. Well, that's a fantastic question and um, I have the answer. <laughs> One, <laughs> this violence is worldwide. The violence against women and children that we're experiencing right now during COVID is worldwide. We've been given a name, the shadow pandemic. As the pandemic, COVID pandemic is ravaging the world, there's a shadow pandemic that's also ravaging the world, and the pandemic is waging war on women and children, mostly. So is this a new thing? No, it's not a new thing. What COVID has done more than anything is put a magnifying glass to problems we already had, and two, it has sped up the rot. So we already had rotten structures, rotten cultures, rotten response to social issues, deep injustices and inequalities in our system, what COVID has done is exacerbate these things. They've made them worse overnight. Why? Because with COVID, we've also seen restrictions on movements. We've seen people's livelihoods being affected negatively. We know that more people are going through hardship. So, And when there's stress and there's oppression, it's not to justify it, but this is just the reality. When people are under pressure, they lash out. When I'm under pressure, I'm more likely to snap at my children than when I'm not for the same thing. So if I'm just chilling, I'm not particularly stressed out at work or nobody has bashed my car or I'm not frustrated at the diesel bill or they've not just come to cut our line and my child breaks something. My reaction at that moment depends on just how stressed I am. So likewise, with people's livelihoods being affected, a sense of oppression, a sense of uncertainty, All these things are boiling over as a war against the most vulnerable, which is women and children. People feel like they need to take out their stress on somebody else, whether it's beating them or raping them. And this is how some of it is manifesting. I'm quite sure that also domestic violence is high, but we're not seeing the stories in the news, same way we're seeing the stories of sexual gender-based violence. But in Syria alone, a five-year-old was just raped to death. We've seen stories in Nigeria of three-year-olds, four-year-olds. It's across the continent, it's across West Africa, it's across the world. Then come back to Nigeria on sexual gender violence. We, ordinarily, we've had a really horrible culture of sexual gender violence against women. There was a report, I think 2012, called Women in Nigeria Report, that was a joint research done by the British Council and I think the Ministry of Women Affairs and Ministry of Finance, because I think we had Okonjo-Wela then. Yeah, this was around 2012, yes. That was the time we were making a lot of strides in terms of saying, let's do gender budgeting and things like that. Anyway, the report showed that I think one in six or one in five women have experienced sexual gender-based violence, separate from domestic violence and just violence in general. So when you now look at the numbers in terms of prosecution, you see that very few people are prosecuted for it. We have patriarchy that sort of places men above women and children. Then you have an ageist society where we believe older people over younger people. Then you have a society where you have no law and order, where your police is, lack of a better way of describing it, largely exploitative and designed to protect the regime as opposed to protect the people. You have a judiciary that is weakened and not independent and largely doesn't care. Oh, let's not forget sex for graves. You saw the documentary that came out last year that the BBC did on Unilag and another another school in Ghana. So it's it's in our culture. I hear the National Assembly, when they do their budgeting for conferences and meetings, if you look at the item, there's conference materials. They say conference materials apparently includes women. That conference materials is a cover for women. I've heard stories of men in meetings, government meetings, where a good part of the government meeting is spent on whether they're going to travel with blankets, blankets being a code for women. So this is our culture. You have stories of people who are abused and then the whole family will be on the neck of the mother or the child who wants justice. The family. So we have a real, real deep societal issue. I agree that a state of emergency should be declared, but the truth is 
a state of emergency was declared around sexual gender based violence in Sierra Leone last year. Despite that, poor Khadija was raped to death, a five year old, by her uncle, with the knowledge of the uncle's mother and the girl's auntie. So, declaring a state of emergency for me is, is rhetoric. What is going to be done? What needs to be done? How do you have somebody who alleges that she was raped? We've seen it not once, we've seen it not twice, harassed by the police. The truth is, again, like demanding good governance, do we want to see an end to sexual gender violence in Nigeria? It's almost, in a way, also up to us. Do we want to have zero tolerance? Because if, as a society, we excuse it, if even on a family level, we can find it in our hearts to excuse the people we know who are molesting young girls, when we refuse to believe young girls, when we refuse to believe adults who come forward, then as a society, we're saying this is not important to us. And the government will take their cue from there. I have a two-part question. And please indulge maybe some of my own ignorance here. Now, I look at history and there is some form of correlation, maybe not necessarily causal, that as societies get richer, they also improve in gender equality. So do you think some of these problems are economic? Is it so naughty as a problem right now because we are still largely a poor society? Is that a two-part question? Should I wait for the other one? Yeah, wait for the other one. Okay. Well, it's a good question. And the truth is, um, I don't have the research to say yay or nay. I do know, though, that in a few countries, I know Brazil is definitely one, where this sense that, oh, let's empower women economically. And I said I want to stop using that word, <laughs> empower. Where, anyway, women have been given or are supported to be more economically independent. We've actually seen violence rise in their homes. As the men find it extremely uncomfortable that the women are earning, maybe not even earning more than they are, but just that the women are earning, they don't like the confidence it gives them. And you see an increase in violence. That has been documented. When I think of women, let's just say like me, who are abused at home or who are abused in the workplace, we're not poor. And the people abusing us are not poor either. So I would wonder where that comes in. Unless it is that the entire society, when you have pockets of wealth, there's some sort of mental impoverishment. I mean, that could be the only explanation. That's one explanation anyway that you'd say that, okay, so... How do you account for sexual gender-based violence and domestic violence within rich or middle-class communities? And this this is not special to Nigeria either. It's something that happens everywhere. So I still bring it back to patriarchy and culture. I still think that it's not enough to say it's because we're poor. Because then the argument would be, well, your state is not poor. Why does my police not care? How much is the police budget? I'm sorry, I wish I had that number at my fingertips. When a rape victim, when a, when a mother comes in with a child and says that child has been raped, why is our police too poor to be able to treat them humanely, question them humanely, capture their stories humanely instead of reporting the mother or brutalizing the girl by asking stupid questions about how she caused what happened to her, even if she's under five years old? So where does poverty fit in? Where are judges who get a huge chunk of money? You can even excuse the judges. Maybe you say, because if cases are not prosecuted by the state, this is a crime. So ideally, in these types of cases, it's not supposed to be the mother of a child or me who is a rape victim who is prosecuting the case. The state should be prosecuting the state. Is the state too poor to prosecute these cases? Is the state too poor to hire public defenders for people who are too poor to hire lawyers for themselves? Is that what we're saying? The state is the one that's going to determine what kind of society that we want to live in. So I'm afraid I don't really buy the poverty one. I think that it is a cultural one. Our problem is cultural, it's not poverty. It's not economic. Because even rich people exploit women and girls. Even educated people do. So it's now a culture. This is our culture. Pastors do it. Imams do it. Governors do it. Ministers do it. People in civil society do it. Bankers do it. Teachers do it. Policemen do it. Everybody's doing it. It's not about poverty. It's about culture. It's about what we accept. I love that answer. I wish we had hours to unpack all the various details and nuances. So the second part is, 
again, to be honest, I never tweet or speak publicly about this stuff because some of these platforms are not really optimized for a nuanced conversation. Yeah. And so I noticed that there is a pattern. I mean, when people push back or advocate or complain or protest sexual violence against women and children, particularly against women. Now, there's a pattern which is, oh, stop raping women. And yeah, I have no problem with that message. But then you have a certain group of people who say, oh, well, not all men are rapists. And then the conversation devolves into a lot of anger, name calling. What are the nuances? I mean, in sexual violence, does biology, mental health, and other things other than being a male or a female, do those other things not count or explain some of the cases? Mm, I'm not sure I understand this last part. You might have to unpack that part. I mean, I understood up to when you said, does biology not play a role? Until that point, I was understanding where you're coming from and where you're trying to go. But this last... Okay, okay, okay. for example, mm. we know that, and when I say we know, I'm talking about maybe consensus in the psychological science, that pedophiles, for example, have a certain psychological profile. Mm. They mm. might not have a normal brain, like, you know, an average person. Mm. And there is also some evidence that people who rape, they are serial rapists, mm-hmm. of course. I mean, mm. just like serial killers, they are also of a certain psychological profile. Mm. So I take the cultural argument absolutely true. There's an ingrained problem with our culture, with how we see women, how we treat women, how we talk about women, and it reflects, you know, right? But I mean, specifically about the violence, which is quite troubling, which bothers me a great deal, which I would like to see a lot more movement in terms of change and not argument and not controversy and all the things that poison that conversation. So should we start looking into mental illness and not just the gender of the accused or the perpetrator? Yeah. Okay, now I understand and it's perfect and wow, this is a this is very loaded and um, I'm really not sure I can do justice to it. Maybe after our interview you will have another session with people who are psychologists, but I'll try and unpack them one by one. I mean the different issues that I've seen in this last question or comment or reflection the not all men are rapists of course it's understood where that is coming from but if we compare it as someone has done recently to when we say black lives matter and then people say all lives matter there's also a reaction because in saying black lives matter we're not saying all lives don't matter we're saying black lives are in danger because the numbers tell us that more black people are being killed by the police. So nobody's saying white people don't get killed by the police. But what he's saying is that there's a systemic structural racism in the U.S. police force that targets black people. I mean, so people will argue that their fate's worse than death. What the African-Americans go through in terms of being used as a feeder for Americans' prison complex, you could argue that for some people, that fate is worse than death. It's like a living death. And it's not unconnected to the fact that the 13th Amendment that abolished slavery somehow left an exception for prisoners to still be treated as slaves, creating an incentive to have slaves and to be able to capture a good part of your population as slaves. So going back to not all men, it angers women and men when some men say that. Because in saying men are the rapists, we're talking about the data. Nobody's saying women don't rape. And it's actually quite useful that many men are also now sharing very troubling stories of how their first sexual encounter was rape, literally. Which brings us now down to this mental issue. There's evidence, none of it Nigerian-based, but there's evidence to show that people who are abused go on to abuse. So if you are raped as a child, if you are molested as a child, some people will become molesters. 
if you are raised in a violent household where you are hit as a child, you watch your mother being hit, or let's just say to be fair, your father being hit, you will most likely grow up into an adult who will hit their child, who hit their spouse. This is documented. So you're right. Sometimes when I hear these stories, I do think, oh my God, we're a nation of abused. And we're all going on to transfer our abuse to other people. You hear horrifying stories, videos of women abusing house help in very degrading, sadistic ways. And you're like, ah, ah. So this comes to the trauma that it would be fair to say maybe a good section of Nigerians are going through, but we don't invest in mental health. We don't recognize it. And literally, mental health is tied to health, where as a country, we've not put health as a priority. That's also one of the things that's become glaring from the pandemic. We've known that our healthcare is inadequate. I mean, constantly we're go funding people who need to travel abroad. It seems that there's no serious illness that we can treat in Nigeria. We just don't have the capacity. Where we have the capacity, it is very limited. So if we can't even do basic public health rights, basic public health is literally maternal mortality, infant mortality, just making sure pregnant women don't die, making sure babies don't die, toddlers below the age of five don't die. If we can't treat accidents, gunshot wounds, basic things, how will we get to mental health? Where will the investment come from? But the truth is we do need an investment in public health. To be honest... We can actually tie the sexual gender-based violence going on against young boys and young girls and women. We can make it an economic issue because we can say, what is the impact of all these people who are emotionally stunted in one way or the other? I'm not saying everybody who is raped or who has been abused has mental issues. But in one way or the other, how are these things affecting our productivity as a society? How many man hours are lost in dealing with these issues? How many man hours, women hours are lost in terms of productivity for women who are running, hiding, trying to dodge abusive husbands, abusive uh, uncles who feel entitled to the bodies of their daughters? How many man hours and women hours are spent on avoiding all this? If we were really to treat all these cases the way we would, then you would not be asking, what is the financial burden on our healthcare system? If we had a serious government, the government would say, this is a pandemic that we must stop because this is draining our people and draining our resources. So I agree with you that the conversation could be expanded. I am hopeful that it will be because I think we're getting there. I know that the conversations are quite painful. They can get quite heated. I personally welcome them as painful as they are because I think we're sort of undergoing the psychological therapy that we need to first discuss these things. And you know, they say there's stages to grief. I can't remember all the stages, but the anger is one of them. Maybe we're going through the anger stage. We'll get through the anger stage and get to the solution part. Maybe the solutions will be, will be home-driven because we will now have had these conversations, had these revelations, had these stories told and told and retold. So the people will get to where me and you are now saying, okay, how do we move forward? Which is why my first answer, I said, it's the lack of seriousness that the states treat this issue of se- sexual gender based violence is in part reflection of your society where women have been so objectified as sexual objects. There is a strong sense in Nigeria that any woman who has anything because she's sleeping with somebody. So sex has been seen as a commodity, which in a way is almost as if the women are the sellers and the buyers, which is madness. We cannot be the sellers and the buyers. Men are the buyers, obviously. Well, at least some of them are selling too. But So I'm just saying this accusation that oh sex sex women use sex to get what they want women use sex to manipulate in fact that narrative is not even spilling down to small girls innocent children what are they trying to get what do they want to get so all these angry conversations should lead to us saying you know enough is enough we spend i i I will confess i spend an inordinate amount of time on whatsapp platforms and groups where we're constantly asking who can shelter one three-year-old who can shelter a four-year-old there is a 16-year-old who is being raped by her stepfather Where can she go? And you're saying, where is the state? In the 21st century, how is it impossible? I think only Lagos that I know of, forgive me, the other states, Lagos is the only state I know that has a shelter for women as per it is a state shelter. And I'm quite sure that even what they can afford and what they can do and who they can cover is limited. But most states, you do not have a place where a woman and her children who are being abused and being terrorized can go to. 
which makes it even harder for you to get the support that you need. So if, for example, your family is not with you in terms of trying to avoid the abuse of your daughter or your son in the hands of a relation, which is often the case, where do you go? Do you now go under a bridge with these same children who are traumatized? Your state doesn't even provide for this. So again, it comes back to governance and politics. When we vote for these people, what are we voting for? What do they do for us? What do they do for us that makes us every four years go out and vote for these same people? Which one thing, which one thing are Nigerians passionate about? Which one thing, Toby, are you passionate about? They are saying, ah, this issue is so important to me that if it is not addressed, I want some serious reform. I'm sure every single Nigerian has one of those such issues. Yes, we do not make it campaign issues. Yes, we allow these people to just tell us lies. We cannot hold them accountable. Then the next four years comes again and we, t- we all troop out. Are we all mad? 39 questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's been yeah. really interesting. You can subscribe to the podcast on all platforms. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and the rest. Or you can just subscribe directly at our website, ideasontrap.com. Thank you and see you next time.